Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Hello, and welcome to Neighborhood Unitarian Universalist Church in Pasadena. Welcome to all members, friends, and guests here in person and virtually. My name is Abby Evans, and I'm a member of your Board of Trustees. Neighborhood Church creates and grows an inclusive community of faith connected by love, spirit, and service. We acknowledge our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrieleno Tongva peoples, the traditional caretakers of the lands and waters of this campus. With respect for the rights and wisdom of indigenous people, we acknowledge our harmful colonial histories and commit to decolonizing our own practices, to learning new ways of being in community, and in good relationship with the indigenous people of this land and the land itself. Today's service is led by the Reverend Carlton Smith as lead for the Pacific Western Region of the Unitarian Universalist Association, Reverend Smith manages a team of people who coach, connect, and challenge, and companion UU congregations from states west of the Rocky Mountains. Since ordained as a minister in 1995, Reverend Smith has served as a parish minister at congregations in the Northeast and up in Oakland. He's also the author of Try My Jesus, Daily Reflections to Free Your Mind, Deepen Your Faith, and Invite Universal Love into Your Life. Yesterday, he led us in a workshop exploring our vision for Neighborhood Church, and he'll be speaking more about that today. Music tip for today's service is led by Dr. Zaneda Robles, Wells Lang, and the ever-intrepid Neighborhood Choir. <laughs> Please... <laughs> I make it up every day. Please, thank you. Please take a moment to silence your devices as we can begin our service. Thank you for joining us as we continue to prior, prioritize connection over perfection in this hybrid service, which is streamed and recorded on YouTube. Based on the guidance from our COVID safety team, masks are recommended, though optional, for congregants inside and are optional outside. Families with young children are welcome in the sanctuary, the narthex, or in our new family lounge located in the living room of Neighborhood House where the service is live streamed on a big screen and the lounge is staffed by a host to help you feel at home. We have a couple of announcements today. First of all, Dining for Dollars was a great success. Thank you so much. Now the lucky winners will be contacted soon and be sure to check the uh, next, next week's newsletter for a last chance for various opportunities. Uh, very exciting, very exciting announcement. This past Monday, the Pasadena City Council unanimously approved a resolution declaring a climate emergency and setting a goal to source 100% of Pasadena's electricity from carbon-free sources by 2030. This is a huge step forward, and Neighborhood Church has been essential in supporting the Pasadena 100 Coalition, which spearheaded this resolution. And we just want to thank all of the people who worked hard on this in our environmental action group. I'm going to name a couple of them. Peter Eisenhart, of course, Peggy Payton, Skylar Gehring, Lauren Corey, Robin Robinson, and John O'Dell. Please, please see this week's newsletter for more information on you can help combat catastrophic climate change. And today here at Neighborhood, after the service at one o'clock, we have the writing group meeting in room 23. We have the drop-in chalice circle in the dining room. Visitors are welcome to that. And you can enjoy pastries with pagans in room 21. Uh, check out this week's newsletter for an update from our ministerial search committee and more information on all the programs and activities going on here at Neighborhood. Our order of service and more extensive announcements are available as a link in the Sunday email. They're posted in the narthex or through the QR code on the back of your hymnal. You can always get more information on these and many other activities at the welcome table outside. Again, welcome to Neighborhood Church, whoever you are and wherever you are in your spiritual journey. Welcome to this inclusive faith community connected by love, 
spirit, and service. Our opening words today are attributed to Kalidasa. Look to this day, for it is life, the very life of life. In its brief course lie all the verities and realities of your existence, the bliss of growth, the glory of action, the splendor of beauty. For yesterday is but a dream, and tomorrow is only a vision. But today, well lived, makes every yesterday a dream of happiness and every tomorrow a vision of hope. Look well, therefore, to this day. worship together. Our opening hymn is number 129 in your gray hymnal or on the screens above. Please rise in body or in spirit as we sing in unison, let love continue long.
I'm Matt Vasco, Neighborhoods Director of Spiritual Exploration. May I please have all of the children and youth forward for a story for all ages. Come on down. Hi. Good to see you again. Welcome, welcome. So, Reverend Carlton E. Smith is with us. He's one of our regional leads, and he's here to help us envision the future. And he wants to hear everybody's ideas and have us share ideas with one another about how we envision the future of this church. And of course, that brought this book to my mind, which is, What Do You Do With an Idea? by Kobe Yamada, illustrated by May Beesom. It's a great one. Our February Soul Matters theme is love, so... That opening hymn was very appropriate for our February theme. And we're talking about all kinds of love. The love that exists between siblings and parents and children and children and parents. And here in our wonderful neighborhood church community. One day, I had an idea where did it come from? Why is it here? I wondered, what do you do with an idea? At first, I didn't think much of it. It seemed kind of strange and fragile. See, it's a little egg there, fragile little egg. I didn't know what to do with it, so I just walked away from it. I acted like it didn't belong to me, but it followed me. <laughs> I worried what others would think. What would people say about my idea? I kept it to myself. I would hid it away and didn't talk about it. I tried to act like everything was the same as it was before my idea showed up. But there was something magical about my idea. I had to admit I felt better and happier when it was around. I, or sorry, it wanted food. It wanted to play. Actually, it wanted a lot of attention. It grew bigger and we became friends. There they are traveling together. I showed it to other people, even though I was afraid of what they would say. I was afraid that if people saw it, they would laugh at it. I was afraid they would think it was silly. And many of them did. They said it was no good. They said it was too weird. They said it was a waste of time and that it would never become anything. And at first, I believed them. I actually thought about giving up on my idea. I almost listened to them. But then I realized, what did they really know? This is my idea, I thought. No one knows it like I do. And it's okay if it's different and weird and maybe a little crazy. I decided to protect it, to care for it, 
to feed it good food. I worked with it. I played with it. But most of all, I gave it my attention. I give your ideas attention. My idea grew and grew, and so did my love for it. I built a new house, one with an open roof where it could look up at the stars, a place where it could be safe to dream. I liked being with my idea. It made me feel alive, like I could do anything. It encouraged me to think big and then to think bigger. It shared its secrets with me. It showed me how to walk on my hands because it said it's good to have the ability to see things differently. I couldn't imagine my life without it. Look how colorful the world's become now. Then, one day, something amazing happened. My idea changed right before my eyes. It spread its wings, took flight, and burst into the sky. I didn't know how to describe it, but it went from being here to being everywhere. It wasn't just part of me anymore. It was now part of everything. And then I realized what you do with an idea. You change the world. The end. Thank you. Please join me in singing our children and youth out to their spiritual exploration classes. is a spiritual practice through which we put our values into action. Each Sunday, our congregation dedicates 100% of contributions to a local social justice organization or activity. If you're visiting for the first time or second time, welcome. You're our guest. Please let the plate pass you by. In addition to the plate, online giving is available using the QR code on the donations box just outside the sanctuary or using the text shown on the screen. If you're a member and wish to make a payment toward your pledge or wish to make a gift, make a note in the subject line or use an envelope available at the donation box. This week, our gifts go to Sages and Seekers, an organization that builds meaningful relationships between older adults and teens with the goal of diminishing ageism and combating social isolation. Here to tell us more about Sages and Seekers is their program director, Rachel Shader. Thank you all for having me here today to talk about Sages and Seekers. In a moment, I'm going to show you a video about our program, but first I want to expand on our mission and why I believe our work is so important. Sages and Seekers began well before the pandemic, when social isolation was not something people were generally aware of or discussed. Social isolation and loneliness is not something new. It's something that older adults and teenagers have both experienced for quite some time, and the pandemic has only made it worse. 
Social isolation is not just a mental health issue. There was actually a study done that concluded that a lack of social connection heightens health risks as much as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So Sages and Seekers' goal of combating social isolation by bringing together teens, our seekers, with older adults, our sages, addresses both a mental and physical health epidemic. For some of the adults in our program, they really are socially isolated. Interacting with a teen may be the only social interaction they do that day or even that week. For other adults, they may not consider themselves isolated. They already participate in many activities like being in a book club, going to church, playing golf, or playing bridge with friends. But as many of you know, after you retire or after your kids are grown and out of the house, there are a lot of hours to fill in a day. A program like ours is a weekly activity that brings a meaningful social connection into someone's life. It's a program that provides many older adults with a sense of purpose and a sense of relevance. Sages share their life stories and their teen partner listens, asks questions, doesn't roll her eyes, or say, Grandma, we've heard that story before. Seekers pick up on life lessons from these stories that they can apply to their own lives. The teens no longer see an older adult as the woman with gray hair or the man with a cane. They see them as someone who was once a teenager too, who also had their heart broken by a boyfriend or who thought their parents were too strict. Now you may know a teenager who has a big group of friends and is even considered popular. Even those teens often feel socially isolated because they don't feel like they can really share their problems or concerns with their friends or parents. We had a teen in our program who had belonged to a gang for many years and wanted to get out. He didn't want to reveal to his parents he was in a gang for fear of what they'd say. He couldn't tell his friends, who may have also been in that gang, that he wanted to leave. But he told his sage about his situation. Many teens, even ones who seem to have a lot of friends, are often really struggling with mental health issues. They need someone to talk to about their worries. They need someone who will just listen and isn't going to judge them. Sages and Seekers provides an outlet for both these generations to talk about life, both the good and the bad. We are not a mentoring program. If anything, we are a co-mentoring program because we believe that sages have as much to learn from the seekers as the seekers can learn from the sages. Now you'll see a video that shows exactly how our program works. In addition to supporting sages and seekers financially, we are always looking for new participants. We have in-person programs at LA area high schools. We currently have one at Blair High School here in Pasadena. We also offer Zoom programs with sages and seekers from around the country. So if you're interested in learning more, you can find me after the service. Thank you for your support. Sages and Seekers is an intergenerational program designed to develop empathy and diminish social isolation and ageism. Our participants are older adults who we call the Sages and high school students who we call the Seekers. They have a lot to offer. I had some participants that they were very quiet or shy. Now they open up. This program should be in every single senior center around the country. The first week is really an icebreaker where we sit in a big circle and we begin to shatter the stereotypes that each generation has about the other. The second week is the speed dating where every student gets an opportunity to speak with every sage and decide who they want to work with. The third, fourth, fifth, and sixth week is one-on-one. -on -one. These students during that four weeks talk about how to deal with really crucial life experiences. The seventh week is the presentation week. Every student is asked to write a 750 word essay highlighting the impact that the sage has had on their life. And the eighth week is a debriefing and we talk about the impact as a group. It's amazing how they get connected with each other. And I feel like sometimes they will be friends for a long time. Not only has she become my mentor in the short time that I've known her, but she has also become my friend. 
that's what I want to do. I want to make a difference in someone's life. They can do anything they want to do. You can change the world. He is very optimistic and hopeful, and she gives me the courage to be who I want to be when I get older. The Eisner Foundation has helped me expand the Sages and Seekers program. Both of our missions are aligned in wanting to bring intergenerational programming to all communities. It was a window into Samantha's generation. She's kept me young. It's good for my heart. It's good for my health. I need to start embracing these new chapters in my life and go out and reach for the things I want. I kind of want to embrace that lifestyle, and I got that from Judy. When you bring these two age groups together, they begin to see the similarities that lays the groundwork for a deeper connection. Thank you, Rachel. And the plates can come forward to be passed. Examine that heart of yours as you look for the love on your high shelf, past the pleasure and passion for your own self, for the love that's reaching someone else. Your heart's a chameleon, ever open to change like any flower spreading out for the sun, petals bursting with power, to be loved, love that's reaching someone else. Find the love, seek the love in you, and find the joy that comes to those who care. Seek the love in you. It only grows whenever it is shared. Busca el amor.
What a wonderful music program you have. It's good. There's a special spot in my heart for church musicians. My mom, uh, may she rest in peace, uh, was a church musician for all of her life uh, up until the, into our 80s. Uh, so I'm just very grateful for Dr. Zeneda Robles, for the choir, for Wells Lang, thank you so much, and for everyone who's helped us gather together, for the tech team, for Matt, Abby, thank you for that very generous introduction. I appreciate that. Um, so, as we begin, I want to say, as was mentioned, uh, I did become a first-time author uh, just uh, about a year ago, and it's been a real gift. And I understand Teresa might have said a thing or two about that little book that I wrote uh, called Try My Jesus, and it was based on the sayings of Jesus from the Gospels, um, but taken from sort of a Unitarian Universalist perspective uh, at that somewhat similar to the work that Sophia Lyon Foss, the Unitarian religious educator extraordinaire, uh, had done with her book in that it lifts up humanity and divinity as kind of mutually arising. And it's something that we all possess, not just some specific people, but that we all possess and share. And one of the ways that we show our appreciation for one another is by loving up on some of the same people. And I've had a chance to lift up some of those already. Might I be able to lift a few more? Do you have time for that today? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, we can't leave out the Reverend Dr. Teresa Cooley, who's not with us uh, today. She had to go to her uh, aunt's funeral this weekend. And as I was going to be here for yesterday's workshop anyway, it made sense that I might step in. So I offered that, she accepted. And I'm glad that she is someone who trusts me with you all, her beloved uh, congregation, as your interim minister. And I so appreciate her as a colleague, as someone who just brings a wonderful spirit of friendship and collegiality and scholarship and everything to all that she does. So we uh, wish her uh, safe travels back here to Pasadena. I bring you greetings from the Reverend Sarah Gibb Milspa who is part of the team that I manage for the Pacific Western region. She is, in fact, the primary contact for Neighborhood Church, and some of you have had a chance to work with her already over the years. Um, she is the person who also created much of the slide deck that I was working with yesterday as I was leading our vision workshop, so I feel her energy with us in the space as well. I'm also grateful today for the leadership and dedication of our visionary leaders on the national level, which I get to represent and bring you greetings on behalf of. Uh, that includes the UUA president, Reverend Susan Frederick Gray, Carrie McDonald, executive vice president, and the person whom I report to, who is Jessica York, the director of congregational life for our association. It's good to see all these many familiar faces. Some of you I've had a chance to see on Zoom before uh, over the past few years. Some of you I've met at General Assemblies. All of y'all, each and every one of you, it's just so good to be with you today. I also want to take a moment to lift up neighborhoods' increased giving in recent years to our UUA's annual program fund. Thank you so much for making generosity, through your generosity, making it possible for me and the rest of our UUA staff to serve our congregations from coast to coast and beyond, and for making it possible for us to make our Unitarian Universalist values real in the world. We Pacific Western Region staff and the Stewardship and Development Office nationally are all here to support you in your thriving, part of which is reflected in your consistent covenantal giving to our annual program fund. Uh, also, thank you to Elizabeth and Trace for hosting me this weekend. I really appreciate your generosity. Again, to Elizabeth and James and S James Coombs and several other leaders who met with me on Zoom to help me put together uh, yesterday's vision workshop. Uh, Anna, May, Milo, Taylor, Myrna, Abby, everyone who was online yesterday, everyone who was in person yesterday, and everyone who is here today, right now, and online. Did I leave anybody out? <laughs> okay, great. 
So the quote that inspired today's sermon is from uh, the book of Proverbs, uh, chapter 29 and verse 18, where there's no vision, the people perish, but those that keep the law, happy are they. So I want to look at three aspects of visioning. And the first is creating a vision requires understanding. And then after that, maintaining a vision requires focus. And fulfilling a, re a vision requires perseverance. So first, creating a vision requires understanding. So these days, sometimes some of you might have heard some of the younger people, I don't count myself as one of those, speak about understanding the assignment. It's that moment when, say, the actress Zendaya hits the red carpet, clothed in couture from head to toe that is on theme for the occasion, and pushes fashion forward while also honoring its past. We would say that Zendaya understood the assignment. Or it's when then Supreme Court Justice nominee Katanji Brown Jackson wisely and patiently responded to hostile and even insulting questions from some of the senators at her confirmation hearing on her way to making history. Now so a Supreme Court Justice, we can say that Katanji Brown Jackson understood the assignment. <laughs> Understanding the assignment from my perspective is being able to accomplish a task skillfully and prophetically, even though there are tensions between ways of being that seem to pull against each other. Think of it as being, say, kind but also tough, smart and humble, current and traditional. One of the questions we might ask is, what is the assignment for us today and for Unitarian Universalist congregations like Neighborhood in our troubled times? With a hat tip especially to the best intentions of the universalist side of Unitarian Universalism, I offer that our assignment is to love as fearlessly and as relentlessly as we know how. I think this ties in a bit to your own mission statement, this idea that we might take on as our assignment to love as fearlessly and as relentlessly as we know how. Sometimes I paraphrase the children's television icon and activist Fred Rogers, who said, in a cynical world, we somehow have to make goodness attractive. In a polarized world, we somehow strive to create bridges of understanding and empathy. In a dangerous world, we dare to be vulnerable. In a sometimes too comfortable liberal world, we offer compelling alternatives to the sense of belonging and care that many sometimes find in organizations rooted in hatred, exclusion, and fear. In a changing world, we recognize the legitimate value that predominantly white organizations like the UUA have added, while we also seek to break the chokehold of historic oppressions of all kinds on our societies and in our lives. And I know that you all have done a lot of that work here already, and we're so grateful for that. So first, creating a vision requires understanding. Next, maintaining a vision requires focus. Now, I'll give you a little taste of some of the conversations we were having yesterday in the workshop on visioning. And I, again, my appreciation to everyone who participated in answering and engaging with the questions that I, we posed. Uh, the first, one of the questions we posed is like, well, what does community mean at Neighborhood? And these are some of the responses that came forward. You might be, see if these sound familiar to you, if these resonate with you. Community has something to do with knowing people, friendship, support, working toward a common goal, belonging, having similar values, having a safe space, being connected, gathering with like-minded people, and participating in liturgy together. And then there's also a side of all of this being in community that can present some challenges. Sometimes community can look a little bit cliquish. Sometimes we have little cliques inside of our communities. 
And it can be difficult sometimes to be true to oneself in the context of a community without being off-putting to others. What were some of the other questions that came up? Well, one of them was this. On the downside of the pandemic, where will the heart of our ministry now be that now the Sunday morning attendance in person is less of a priority for many of us? Well, that was kind of a provocative question to ask. In fact, it led to a lot of questions about the question itself before we could engage with the, with the uh, question in our smaller group conversations. The questions like, well, maybe it depends on which service you attend, if you have that perspective or not. And did we really have more attendance before the pandemic than what we have now? And there were strong opinions on this question. Some felt very strongly the heart of our ministry is in person. And some felt equally as strongly the heart of our ministry is not Sunday morning or the minister themselves. The heart is in the many aspects of the church community itself, spread out over the whole week. Some thought that we should ask the young people present to answer this question. As it turns out, yesterday there weren't a lot of young people present. <laughs> that we needed to, there needed to be more appeal to young families as well. On the question of how we can deepen a sense of being part of neighborhood church and the commitment to it across the many ways of participating, answers came back like this, that the congregation needed shared rituals, a shared experience, or a shared identity. That people valued a personal invitation to belonging to a group like a congregation or some of the subsets of a congregation, whether it's the choir or different other aspects. That, that sense of belonging and sense of being a part can come from listening to people, taking a survey, helping people move from the margins of the community toward the center. Moving from being passive consumers to active participants also helps people feel like they're a part. And perhaps even having a core group of people focused on membership, like say having a membership committee and people engaged with that. And while all of these responses, I thought, were very strong in their own way, I also wondered, now, what might be some of the things that might be behind that? And sometimes we have to think about the why that we do things. It's great to do all of the many things that we do, but what's the reason? What's the unifying idea that holds all of that together? I also have a concern sometimes that we go straight to sharing our very strongly held opinions um, rather than focusing on lifting up the stories that we might share amongst ourselves. And so I would like to offer you this as a possibility. And I know this is true for me as well because I, I every now and then have a strong opinion about something that I will you know, just kind of blurt out there. What might be possible if we choose rather than sharing our strong opinions and we get stuck in that place, well, I believe this and you believe that and we're just sort of clashing, what might be possible if we pause for a moment and say, tell me a story about how you came to believe as you do. Tell me a story how you came to hold the opinion that we do. That touches a bit on sages and seekers as we heard earlier today, that people go from being these abstract we go from having an abstract way of relating to people to having a greater connection with them because we hear their stories and understand more about them. And those become dynamic and alive within us. Sometimes we value the positions that we hold more than we value the relationships themselves with the people that we're in communication with. But at the end of the day, a congregation like Neighborhood is a network of relationships sustained over time, going back over 100 years here. And the health of the community and the well-being of the community emerges from the quality of those relationships. So we can think about stories that are honest and meaningful, stories that can help us maintain focus and come back to that focus when we start to get locked into our perspectives and into our opinions and our positions that we cling to so tightly. So we've talked about creating a vision requires understanding, maintaining a vision requires focus, 
and fulfilling a vision calls for perseverance. Fulfilling a vision calls for perseverance. Okay, so this is a pop quiz. Are you ready? Um, this is the first Sunday of February, which is also Black History Month. <laughs> applause, a round of applause. Yes, it's Black History Month indeed. And I would say, if anything, Black History Month and Black History in general is a celebration of perseverance. If you think about uh, people and a community in this country who, against all odds, put at the lowest rung of our socially stratified system that we have here, continues to find ways to excel and find ways to engage and participate and still contribute is a testimony to perseverance. And we've had a rough start to Black History Month. We, just this week, we had Tyree Nichols uh, funeral that happened at the top of Black History Month this year. And all the terrible situation around that, uh, that's my neck of the woods where I'm from, I'm from North Mississippi, which is uh, part of the greater Memphis area. And as we look to that, it also raises the question for me, what does it take to persevere? And I'll tell you one of the things that works for me as a Mississippian, and sometimes I'll tell you a secret. Sometimes people think I'm like not that smart because I'm from Mississippi, or <laughs> think that the state that I come through has nothing to offer. But I have to tell you, our country would be radically different if not for bold, ingenious people in the state of Mississippi who've turned our country basically upside down because they wouldn't stand for oppression and they resisted and fought against it, not just in Mississippi, but across the South and across the country as well. So I give honor to my ancestors at uh, the beginning of Black History Month. So I want to tell you about a few of those ancestors as, we, uh, as I draw toward the close of this sermon. One of them is Ida B. Wells, who is from my hometown of Holly Springs, Mississippi. I had to go to graduate school in Washington, D.C., even though I'm from Mississippi, to learn about Ida B. Wells. Some of you uh, might not be familiar with her. Uh, she actually has a Barbie doll now that just came out a couple of years ago, so that's kind of cool. Um, to get her Barbie doll, what Ida B. Wells had to do, well, she was born in slavery um, at, um, in uh, 1862. She uh, went on to become an educator, first a school teacher, and then she became a journalist in Memphis um, some over 100 years ago. And while she was a journalist, she had some friends who were actually lynched. And because of their lynching, it led to her basically laying the foundation for investigative journalism as we know it. So she did all this re research on lynchings and the reasons people were lynched. And, as, and she went abroad and, and lectured on this. But they chased her out of Memphis because they said to her, if you stay here, we're going to also end your life as well. She ended up in Chicago, co-founded the NAACP, was very involved in women's suffrage, very involved in local groups there. Uh, a good friend of mine is one of her great granddaughters. And so I look to Ida B. Wells for guidance and for that sense of perseverance going all the way back to the 19th century. I would tell you about Wurlis Jackson. Have you ever heard of Wurlis Jackson before? Some of you have. Um, I had not until just a couple of years ago. I work for, an, I, I'm uh, on the board for an organization called the Living Legacy Project that does tours through the historic South. And part of the, uh, and one of the uh, participants in one of our tours told me the story of Wurlis Jackson, who is from Natchez, Mississippi, which is in the Delta. He was very active in the NAACP. He had gotten hired to be basically a supervisor at this tire company that he worked for. And the people were so upset with this. And he knew that his life was at risk for having accepted that position. He accepted it anyway. Um, they put an explosive under the seat of his car. Uh, and when he turned on his engine one evening, the, the bomb in the car detonated and that took his life, leaving behind his wife and I think it was four children altogether that he had. But that's what I think about when I think about perseverance. What does it mean to be willing to sacrifice on that level to go forward? Um, I think of Fannie Lou Hamer. 
um, who was also from the Delta, from Ruleville, Mississippi, and her legacy as well of someone who was willing to be beaten and jailed because she was seeking voting rights. She was part of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party back in the 1960s. They sought to get seated instead of the regular uh, exclusionary Democratic Party, the all-white Democratic Party. They did not succeed that year, but you know what? The Democratic Party has never been the same ever since. So even though they didn't succeed in what they were trying to do on that occasion, long-term, they persevered and helped bring us to where we are today. I think the hope of that generation was that those of us who came behind them I know my dad told me this, we're hoping that we would be sheltered from having to deal with the same struggles that they dealt with in their lifetimes. Um, it didn't work out that way. As we see, there's still an abundance of racism, an abundance of oppression that seems to be resurgent uh, in our culture today. But what does it mean to persevere? It means to continue to face failure time and time and time again to try but to continue to maintain that enthusiasm, that willingness to engage, because you know that with every failure, there's the seeds of success planted in there somewhere. We were talking yesterday about emergent strategy, the ability to adapt and to continue to evolve in a way such that eventually the change that you seek comes about. And we have seen so much change from where those freedom fighters were back in the 20th century to where we are now. We still got a long way to go, but what would it mean for, for neighborhood to identify that thing that it would give its life as a community for in order to achieve, to pursue it, even though it may not come to pass, even though it might run some risk? What would it mean to latch on to that kind of vision? Something that's a little scary, perhaps but something that nonetheless is going to make a difference and change lives. So I ask you today, what is your reference point? What is your next largest context, that way of being, that community that you associate with? And when I was in Charlottesville, Virginia, at the counter protest to the, to the Unite the Right rally, I had to figure that out for myself because we, were, we knew that as soon as we set foot out on the streets of Charlottesville that day, we were marching straight into this horde of white supremacists, that our lives were at risk. In fact, we were told time and again as we were getting ready to go out onto the street that, if, that as soon as you step out of this door, you could be severely injured up to and including death. But when your frame of reference is something larger, when, you're, when I had in my mind the vision, the image of, Dr. King and Medgar Evers and Fannie Lou Hamer and Ida B. Wells and all these people who had made my life richer and better because of their sacrifice, that's how I chose to identify. And that's part of what gave me the ability to persevere under those circumstances. So I ask you today, how, how will you persevere? Creating a vision requires understanding. Maintaining a vision requires focus. And fulfilling a vision requires perseverance, even if it's something that we might not see in the way that we want to in the course of our own lifetimes. I look forward to hearing about the ways that you choose to love fiercely and relentlessly as you know how, while also taking good care of yourselves. There's that tension again. What we do in the name of love will outlive us. After our names have been forgotten, may the love that gave us life and gave life to our visions, speak for us. Amen, ashe, and blessed be.
Okay, we're gonna take the express bus through our shared conversation. How do you feel about that? Is that okay? <laughs> so I will tell you what the uh, instructions are, and they are these. Um, I'm going to ask you, first thing we're gonna do is I'm going to pose a question, and then we're gonna pause for a minute of silence, give folks a chance to collect their thoughts. You're gonna pair up, so we're doing pairs of two. There'll be an A and a B. First, we're gonna have the A's uh, speak and the B's are gonna listen. Uh, we'll give that uh, two minutes and then we're gonna flip and have the B's listen. So does that make sense? Follow that? Great. Um, so this is the prompt. We're talking about the importance of stories and the opportunity that gives us to have a heart connection with one another. So this is the prompt. Share a story about a time when you felt that you belonged with your partner. Share a story about a time you felt you belonged. So we're gonna take a minute of silence to give you an opportunity to conjure a memory of that, and then we'll get into the conversation. One minute of silence. Okay, choose your, yeah, every, does everyone have a partner to be in this conversation with? <laughs> Quietly, to, please, hold it, before you start talking, just, just identify your partner, okay. Okay, so A's begin, two minutes, two minutes, just listen.
Yay, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I hope you appreciated that conversation. Would you take a moment to acknowledge, you don't have to say anything, but acknowledge and show your appreciation to your partner in your conversation. I hope you are inspired to, by having this opportunity to hear about other people's experience of belonging, to think about how that might make a difference as you interact with each other inside this congregation and with people who might be looking for a place like neighborhood. Uh, and know that you are indeed loved and appreciated. Our closing hymn is number 1028 in your teal hymnal, The Fire of Commitment. Please rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing The Fire of Commitment. words are from my colleague, Wayne Arneson, who is very active in the civil rights movement. Take courage, friends. The way is often hard. The path is never clear. And the stakes are very high. Take courage, for deep down there is another truth. You are not alone. Depart in peace, assured that love surrounds you everywhere you may go.